Great. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. I am Emily Hart. I am the Equal Access to All uh, Coordinator for the Bureau of Library Development uh, up here in Tallahassee. And today I'm going to be talking about basics and updates um, for the federal E-rate program for funding year 2020, um, which all still doesn't seem real to me that we're in year 2020. Uh, as I move through, if you have any questions or you'd like to share your experiences um, with anything I'm talking about, please feel free. So if you have been with your library for a little bit, you may have heard of E-rate, but maybe you're not sure what it means. Or um, So in the simplest terms, the FCC, that's the Federal Communications Commission, collects money from all U.S. telecom accounts. It's those services and taxes that you see at the bottom of your cable or phone bill, and you don't really know what those are. That's what funds this. And overall, nationwide, that adds up to about $4 billion annually. Um, they support the E-rate program through the Universal Service Administrative Company, uh, USAC for short. And remember that because I'll be saying it again a lot. Um, it's a separate company from the FCC, but they handle all the nitty gritty of the E-rate program, which includes all applications and reimbursement. E-rate uh, was originally founded in 1996 and was originally created to help schools and libraries pay for the cost of what at that time was dial-up modems, um, so kind of reimbursing phone companies. So here is a quick look at the USAC homepage, just so if you happen to go there. Uh, it's usac.org. And if you land on this page, you'll know what it looks like in advance. You may notice that there are several headers up there at the top. Um, E-rate is the one that we'll be discussing today. <clears throat> and I'm including a link here to this year's LSTA guidelines for the state of Florida. Um, you don't worry, need to worry if you don't get this right now. Um, all these links will go out after the webinar um, so in the list of follow-up material. So in order to be eligible for E-rate, a library must be eligible to receive LSTA funding. And I'd like to talk a little bit now about what constitutes a library. One of the things that we do here uh, in our office and that if you have been in contact with me in the past, I've probably done for you is write a letter to USAC um, certifying a library um, or its branches as qualifying for E-rate. And to do that, I consult the definition in state rule. Those criteria are listed out here. Uh, separate quarters, an organized collection of library materials, paid staff, paid being the operative word there. If your library is solely staffed by volunteers, that is not going to cut it. Um, and lastly, regularly scheduled hours for being open to the public. It's also worth noting that if you have a bookmobile, uh, they are also eligible. They count as traveling branches of a library system. So long as it is a trucker van that carries your organized collection, also has paid staff. That's just a good idea anyway, because you don't want anyone driving a vehicle insured for your library that isn't you know, covered by your insurance and also, also regularly scheduled hours, um, i.e. bookmobile stops for operating with the public. So here at the outset, I'd like to take a moment because one of the big things that we get questions about every year in terms of E-rate is CIPA compliance. CIPA uh, stands for the Children's Internet Protection Act. Um, one of the USAC requirements is that CIPA compliant filters need to be on all computers that use services, whether Wi-Fi or hardwired, that are paid for with E-rate funds. And I can't actually recommend any one particular filtering software over another. I can actually direct everyone to our annual internet safety survey, which includes a list of the filters that are used by all Florida libraries. That link is here. And that way, if you take a second to review that list and you see one of those filters that interests you or that you've heard of, you could reach out to one of those libraries to see what their experiences have been like, what they liked or didn't like. 
So those filters need to be in place on all computers, although they do allow for the possibility that library staff may need to turn off the filter for a patron who meets it for, and I quote, bona fide research purposes. Um, that term is really not defined any further than that. I kind of think intentionally on USAC part. Um, they officially say that authorized persons can turn that filter on or off for bona fide research purposes, and they don't define that either. I have a recommendation here. It's not a requirement. It's just something that I personally think that I would recommend that only library staff have the authority to turn off the internet filter. Um, just to make sure that the default setting is that the filter is on and can be turned off rather than the other way around. And also the filters need to block materials that are obscene, um, whether that's child pornography or in the case of schools, uh, anything that could be deemed harmful to minors. Um, that's just really sort of common sense. You also need to have publicly noticed and held a public meeting or hearing to discuss filtering. Um, another thing that you'll want to hold on to documentation about in case um, program integrity assurance, we'll talk about them more later, um, but they may ask for proof that a meeting like this was held. Um, if you're looking through your E-rate files or your binder and you can't find anything referring to that meeting, um, such as a copy of the meeting minute or the sign-in sheet from it, um, anything that proves that meeting was actually held. You'll probably want to hold another one just to be on the safe side. However, there isn't any particular requirement about having to do it or re-up it every few years. So if your documentation is still there, but it's from, say, 10 years ago, that's fine. It's still good. You'd also want to include a security log from your filter in case PIA were to ask about it. Um, this applies to larger systems with that have multiple branches. Um, if all outlets receive rate funding, then the filter has to be covering all those outlets. And uh, the security log must be kept for them as well. And one thing that USAC mentioned in one of their fall training sessions last year um, is that they are planning on doing more insight visits as part of PIA review moving forward. So having all the documentation about this in place is really going to be helpful if one of those site visits occurs. Uh, if you, this is your first year applying for E-rate, the first time your library has applied, um, you don't have to have a SIPA compliant filter in place. Um, you can still do it in that first year, but by the time you enter your second year, they do want you to have one. They give you a, kind of a pass for that first year, um, but then by the second year, you're expected to be compliant. Uh, and if you're applying again after an absence from the program, say if you applied for the first time back in 2009, and then for whatever reason you didn't apply again in 2010, uh, funding year 2020, even though it was 10 years ago, still counts as your second year in the program. So those are some of the sort of pre-qualification uh, questions, and I'd like to talk a little bit about if you have done all this, what can you actually receive in terms of support? Uh, the amount of money that your library can get is determined by several factors. Uh, there's a breakdown in this table here about the percentage of your bill that would be eligible for reimbursement. Uh, poverty in a particular area is determined by the number of students who receive free or reduced cost lunches um, in your associated school district. That gets reported to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and uh, agriculture then turns around and reports it to USAC for determining the, the poverty level. You might also notice um, there's also a difference between urban and rural discounts. Uh, urban areas are generally regarded as having higher population density, so there, that applies there. And you can see a little bit more about calculating discounts in that link at the bottom, which again will go out at the end of the webinar. So I thought I would pause right now and just see if anyone has any questions before we start talking about the nitty gritty of the process. Okay, looks like we're good. You guys are still with me. So there are two pots of funding for E-rate, category one and category two. 
basically category one is everything that carries the internet to and from your building, uh, upload and download speeds. It's the fiber, it's the series of tubes, um, to paraphrase. It's the cost of transmitting information from your service provider to your facility. Category one can also apply to the construction costs of running fiber to upgrade a connection or if you're constructing a new building. And if you are returning to E-Rate after some time off, you may remember that CAT1 uh, previously included voice connectivity, voice phase down service, uh, sorry, voice service phase down started in funding year 2015, and they've reduced the discount available for that each year. So as of funding year 2020, voice services are no longer covered. And the reason they did that is to provide more funding for things such as category two, um, which is all the connections and equipment within your building that takes the external connection and connects them to your terminals, um, whether that be Wi-Fi access points, routers, switches, all that. It can be used to fund connections to security services, say cameras, but not the security equipment itself. For instance, if you were setting up Wi-Fi enabled cameras in your building, E-Rate would cover the Wi-Fi connection that those run on, but not the cameras themselves. So every year, USAC puts out a new list of the eligible services, and I have a link there to the most current list. So before you begin, my recommendation is to have some of these conversations or at least to stop and consider some things before you start the process. Um, first, I would say to talk to your local procurement office and find out if there are local procedures that you would need to follow. Throughout the process, you have to make sure that you satisfy both your local policy and the federal guidelines. And if there's ever a conflict between the two, they always uh, you generally have to follow the most stringent requirement. Also, I would say to talk to your local IT folks, figure out if there is a technology plan in place for your library. It's not really required by, the US, by USAC, but knowing what you might be working towards uh, locally can be great when it comes to writing your request for bids. And lastly, I would recommend finding out if you are in a contract, where you are in that contract with your internet service provider. If you are wrapping one up right now, then this is a great time to invite other bidders to weigh in. Um, but if you're still, if you're stuck midway through a contract, it's going to be kind of impactful on other parts of this process. So this is a lovely graphic from our friends over at the Department of Management Services, um, talking about the E-rate year and where you might be at any particular point during the year. E-rate is not really a one-time, one-and-done thing. You've finished it and you don't have to worry about it again for a year. It's a yearly cycle. The metaphor that has really worked best for me is that E-rate is like a garden. There are periods where planting is going on. There's periods of planning. There are periods where you might be working quite hard every day and also planning for the next cycle. And then there might be periods where everything is kind of quiet and fallow. But everything has its season. And if you do things out of order or at the wrong time, it will usually lead to bigger headaches and generally less green in your pantry. Thank you guys for preventing me gardening jokes. Excuse me. So the first thing that I would say is check your library's account in Epic. That's the E-Rate Productivity Center. You would either need to make sure that you have access to your library's existing account or start one. You can do that by calling the Customer Support Bureau, which is the number that I got the arrow next to on the screen. Um, I have found that this flowchart is pretty handy for figuring out, figuring out where you are in the process from season to season. Um, where you're supposed to be in your yearly cycle. And again, don't worry if you can't get this right now. I would, I'm also going to be sending this file out after the webinar. I actually have it printed out above my desk here. Now, if you have been in government for a little bit, you're probably familiar with the term Request for Proposals, or RFP. 
USAC doesn't require that you do a formal RFP, but your local procurement policy may, which is why I suggested consulting it. Um, after you've done that, you'll be required to upload it into EPIC so that all internet service providers in your area can see it. Then you will file the Form 470 to request bids for your library's need. Um, unfortunately, there aren't really any snappy nicknames or acronyms for these forms. Each form is just referred to by its federal number. Um, form 470s get filed in EPIC and service providers will search there to see your requests. So one note I want to make about Florida is that I know that the realities of this state mean that we have a lot of pretty rural counties and in some of these areas there might only be one service provider. If that's the case, you'll still need to file the Form 470 and wait the required amount of time, but you can reach out to them directly after that 28 days has passed. Also, if you're in the middle of a multi-year contract, if you did a Form 470 at the start of the process, you don't have to do another one until the contract ends. You're not really required to do an RFP unless you're required to by your local policy, but um, if you have done one, they do ask that you share it with all vendors. So once the Form 470 has been filed, 28 days before moving forward, any responses um, that maybe a vendor might ask and then you need to respond to should be done publicly. And just that's just so that all vendors get the same info. And they are very strict about fair and competitive bidding. Later when we get to PIA review, they're going to want to know about these things. <clears throat> so after you've received bids, you'll need to evaluate. And this is an example of what an evaluation process can look like. Yours can have other factors considered. Um, one that I've heard of is many Florida libraries sort of including that they want a vendor to be flexible on invoicing later on so that they can get the most out of that process for the purposes of state aid. And I can explain a little bit more about that when we get to that part of the process. But I just wanted to include that some libraries have told me that. Uh, one note, the category that has the most points assigned should be the one for lowest cost so that you can certify that you made cost effectiveness a key factor in your decision. It doesn't have to be the sole consideration, but it should be the one with the most points kind of weighted that way. And I would also suggest keeping a copy of this bid matrix, whatever yours ends up looking like, um, in your documentation for E-rate, just in case you get an inquiry about how that was handled. Um, you also have the option to use the Department of Management Services uh, State Master Term Contract, the bottom uh, sorry, the link for which is there at the bottom of the slide. And these are pre-negotiated rates that DMS has got, gotten and libraries can opt in on those. So here's that flow chart again. Now you've put out a request for bids, you've received one or more, and you've conducted a, a bid evaluation to select a vendor you want to go with, and you're ready to apply for funds. Everybody with me so far? All right, now that you have selected a vendor and you're ready to apply, um, there are no more restrictions on how to contact a vendor or having to do it all publicly. Um, it's actually a really good idea to be closely connected with them at this stage, so you can pick up the phone and get someone on the line with any fine detail questions you might have. Um, the filing window for application for this year opened last week uh, on January 15th at noon and it will close at midnight Eastern Standard on March 25th, which means you could file right now if you're ready. Uh, if you're not ready yet, don't worry. The last day you could file your Form 470 is February 26th, so you could file it and still wait that mandatory 28 days. I would like to talk right now about billing and invoicing. Technically, this is a later step in the process, but it is a dis good discussion to have at this point. Um, I would really recommend it. It's something you'd want to discuss with your service provider before everything is signed on a contract, just so you don't get any surprises later on. There are two different ways of receiving reimbursement. There's the BEAR, which stands for Build Entity Applicant Reimbursement. It doesn't have anything to do with large animals. And there's SPI, which stands for Service Provider Invoicing. 
In the bear method, your library pays for their bill in full and then turns around at the end of the year and invoices and invoices USAC for the amount that would be covered by your discount. Uh, kind of like buying something in the store and then sending in for the manufacturer's rebate. Uh, in the SPY method, which is handled primarily by your internet service provider, they invoice USAC for the discount that they give you each month. You'd only see the bill for the non-discounted portion, whichever that might be, which think of that as maybe a particularly good coupon that you would get in the mail and then set aside for when you get your uh, shopping going on. Ultimately, this is your decision. Each method has its advantages and disadvantages. Some people prefer the SPY as it's easier on the library. Um, some libraries have told me that they prefer the bear method, again, so they get the reimbursement check, but all the funds that they spent on the IT bill each month still count as part of uh, your local expenditures for the purposes of state aid. That's a local decision. Um, technically, you wouldn't have to make it until later in the ERA process, but it's really a good idea to have the conversation early on with your service providers um, rather than getting stuck down the line. You could even make it part of your bidding criteria or part of your evaluation matrix uh, if you'd want. So after you've entered your application for discounts, you go into what's called Program Integrity Assurance or PIA review. This is where you're going to get inquiries from a person on the details of your application. And I'd like to give you some tips now to kind of make sure that this process goes as smoothly as possible. First, communication is key. They only make those inquiries uh, in your, the E-Rate Productivity Center or EPIC, and you're required to communicate with them within 15 calendar days. So it's really, really important that you check even after your application is finished, and you're like, phew, go ahead and keep checking it really regularly because if you got a, if a question, you would wanna be able to respond to it in a timely fashion. Again, PIA review is an, not really an audit, but it's also not not an audit. So documentation is your very best friend. PIA also might have some questions about your bidding process. So this is where having that documentation about your bid evaluations would come in handy. They could compare your funding request to this year's eligible services list. And you are also required to certify that you have the ability to pay the non-discounted share um, or for services that aren't eligible. This is one of those check boxes that sometimes people overlook. So I wanted to make sure that it's clear. So the next step, if everything goes smoothly, is a funding commitment. Um, bouncing baby funding commitment. Um, I have another acronym here for you, FCDL, or Funding Commitment Decision Letter. But as with everything in library land, we just have a ton of acronyms we have to remember. FCDLs are issued in EPIC under the newsfeed. Um, they used to send out a real paper letter, but they don't do that any longer. In fact, they don't actually send out an email. It's all in EPIC. So take a moment to review what was committed. It may, could be different from what was in the Form 471, which was requesting funding that you already submitted. So we passed fitting and application and review. So here's that graphic to kind of show you where we're talking about right now in the process. <clears throat> Once again, this part is another form filed in EPIC. The Form 486 confirms that services started, um, basically started when they said that they would, and also that your library is compliant with SIPA, which I kind of already talked about. And you have to file it no more than 120 days after you received your funding commitment decision letter or after the start of services, whichever is later. And I really want to make sure I emphasize that last bullet point here. It's especially important because if you miss that 120 day deadline, USAC will reset the time period to only provide funding for the 120 days before whenever you send your form in and could deny reimbursement for time that was there were services outside that window. And I wanted to highlight that because if you've gone through this whole process, it really seems like a shame to me to have there been, be any eligible time that doesn't get covered. So that link here at the bottom of the slide would take you to the USAC page on filing a Form 486.
All right, does anyone have any questions before I get into invoicing? All right, we are in the final stretch now. So I mentioned this earlier when I was talking about applying for discounts, but uh, this is the point where you actually have to file a form about it. So fair or build entity applicant reimbursement is the one that I compared to a mail-in rebate. These are the things that you need to have in order to file a bear. A funding commitment decision letter, which told you that they decided to give you funds. Uh, a processed form 486, and I'm really sorry that these don't have snappier names. Um, this is your certification that services started and were paid for in full, and that you are in compliance with CIPA. And a form 498, which confirms all details of your financial information are correct in EPIC. Um, they really, this is a lot of money on the table, so they want to make sure that it's going to the right place, which I think we can sympathize with. And payment, for those of you who might not have filed in a while, comes as direct deposit to your bank account. It does not come through the mail or via a check. It will come uh, no more than 120 days after the last date of service for this funding year. So you won't be waiting around for those funds forever. And there is more information about how to do the Forms 472 and 480, sorry, 498 in that link there. See, I get them confused too. Um, SPY, or Service Provider Invoicing, is the method that I compared to a coupon before. Uh, this is really handled more on the service provider end, although USAC may ask one or both of you to provide more documentation that you provide, uh, pay the non-discounted amount of your bills. You still need to have your funding commitment decision letter and your Form 486, but the service provider will file the Form 474 to receive reimbursement. And you really should have been seeing a reduced amount on your bill for the year if you've chosen the SPY method. So some things that I want to emphasize that are kind of outside of the process. Uh, the retention period for all relevant documents is 10 years after the last date of service. Um, so say that you receive funding for funding year 2020 and your service starts on July 1st, 2020 and goes until June 30th, 2021. You would need to keep all documentation for that year's application, billing, filtering, evaluation, everything until 2031, which is really hard for me to get my head around, but it is a requirement. And at any given point, you could be dealing with three years of E-rate. You can talk about reimbursement from last year, this year's services and billing, and also working on your application for next year. So having the right documentation and getting into the habit of keeping it consistently organized is really the key to keeping it all straight. And the last thing I want to discuss is that I'm here, in fact, our whole bureau is here to help you. It is our goal. It is our purpose. Um, if you get confused or have questions, please pick up the phone or write me an email. So I'd like to talk about some of the relatively recent developments in the program. I'm going to take a moment here and drink some water if you guys have any questions. All right, the FCC released uh, last year's eligible services list, or this year's eligible services list, last year in December of 2019. The eligible services link is there, and sadly for a lot of you whose requests I do hear and I do refer them to uh, the ALA who passed them along to USAC, um, but sadly circulating hotspots are not on the eligible services list for this year. I, I hear you guys. I want it to. Um, they also put out a recent news brief, which are those things that I send to the Floor Lib listserv every week, uh, clarifying that you no longer have to get individual service packages broken down into allowable and non-allowable allocations um, if a service is provided as part of, say, the service package anyway. <clears throat> and here's the big one. The funding for category two, um, the funding approach has been permanently adopted. So the funding being set for five-year increments approach is what I mean here. The next cycle will be funding year 2021 to year 2025. Um, if you can do math, that means that they're leaving funding year 2020 out. 
there's a one year extension happening this year of the previous five year set. Um, funding year 2020 will be a one year extension of the budget cycle that began in 2015 and was intended to end in 2019. Basically, once they've adjusted for inflation, they're allocating an additional 20% of the budget cap that was originally allocated to cover the original five year period. So if you happened to have applied back in 2015 and 2016 and spent a bunch of money on upgrades and sort of went through that original five-year allocation, you would now have an additional 20% to spend in this year only. However, if you've never applied before, you would have the whole lump sum available to you again to spend in this year. All right, do any of you guys have any questions or comments? All right, um, I am your friendly neighborhood E-rate coordinator and I will stay on the line for a couple more minutes in case anyone has any questions, but that is my rundown of E-rate for funding year 2020 and I hope that it has been informative for you guys.